Okay, the game actually opens with, in a dream, a depiction of Tokyo saving a girl from a monster, before waking up from it in the middle of class. This is where Saika is introduced, the girl looking a lot like the girl from before, and when she drags him to the roof, this is where he's real digitized, and shoved into the world RX, which has been turned into a desolate wasteland due to Shiksoul. The Twilight Knights, AI recreations of the various series' focus characters, have been turned into stone by some type of program this game tries to sell us as being Data Drain. And again, why the hell is Sakaki amongst them? The last standing is Kite, who, because Tokyo is there, is hit by a shot that paralyzes him as well. Ironically, we then learn Tokyo is fucking immune to it because Tokyo is not an AI or a player character, but actually there physically. Meaning the only reason Kite lost was a pointless act. Kite asks him to go to the Akashic Records, where most of the game takes place, where he meets up with Saika on the timeship The Grand Whale. Which isn't actually a timeship as there's no actual time travel in this game, and it's depicted as a whale. Why? I mean, yeah, Tartarga became a turtle to have Neslam on his back, but there's Eastern mythology symbolic in the world being carried on the back of a turtle that works thematically for it to be where an illegal server inhabited by their AI and hackers, which freely moves across the net, bound to no one place would be. It is its own world. The whale thing does not make sense at all to me. It's here, after Saika tortures Tokyo into submission and then gets him on board with the hero thing stupidly easily, is where the audience is informed that to reach the core of the record, they need four chrono cores, artifacts that can undo the doors and the records to other times, and are hidden in the character data of those part of the four mainline entries. Sign, the core games, Roots, and GU. This necessitates the aforementioned time travel and team-ups. Though it's not explained why only Tokyo is able to do these timeline dives. Normal player characters are apparently incapable of doing it, but it's probably related to his real digitization. At least until you learn all of Shiksoul's player characters are capable of entering these time periods as well. Even when they say they can't survive the same dives Tokyo takes. Or maybe they have something like the Grand Whale that allows their free traversal. But if that is true, then why did we need these Akashic Springs in the first place to unlock the various eras? This is another one of those, it's only there because it's a game things that don't work narratively when you think about them. And I don't mean the context of the World Rx's game-within-a-game status, as this entire place doesn't make sense to be in the world either, except if it's, like, a subsect of one of the Black Box AI files. The Akashic Record is a building in Makanu, and it was made by CC Corp. Saika harps on Tokyo all along the way to not bond with the past memories of the AI recreations to focus on the mission as by completing each period, he already automatically restores the knights related to the time period, even without the interactions. However, Tokyo's involvement proves to be a greater detriment, as by this interaction he uses to claim the protocols from their hosts, he corrupts those that represent and maintain these periods of the timeline, and overwrite them when they are reset in the, for lack of a better term, present. And thus, the memory of everything that has occurred in the world is changed. And believe it or not, this ends up a plot point probably unintended by the writers. They say Tokyo and Saika are fixing errors in the timeline, but the changes they make aren't actually correlated to the true timeline. Meaning they actually create more errors by their presence than they fix, as showcased in the Haseo example earlier. About seven hours in... Yes, I'm not even kidding. It takes around that long to complete Sign section of the game, despite said section actually covering less than a third of Sign's storyline. I can watch all of Sign in about nine hours and get more enjoyment out of it. We begin to get an idea of what Six Souls trying to do that necessitated the creation and thus defeat of the Twilight Knights. CC Corp's trying to pull another Revive Aura plan to take over the entirety of the internet. Aura, having come back to the world for some reason, possibly they matched successfully data mine her out of the background data of the world, has locked herself behind all of the barriers in the Akashic Record. Meaning, yeah, Tokyo and Saika are doing the dirty work of the villains in unlocking the pathway to Aura. Saika, we come to learn, is doing this all intentionally, 
and Tokyo doesn't give a damn as long as he gets to be a hero, even when he is enabling the villains in this story all along the way. And Saika is doing this because she has no idea where Jotaro is, and is searching for clues to his whereabouts through this system. From an anonymous source, we come to learn he is one of the members of Shiksul. As Aura awakens in the Syme timeline, the timeline itself starts the first of its many attempts to correct itself, removing Tokyo from it, only to be saved by the girl from the opening dream, Aika. But as the game isn't ready to address her yet, it's shoved to the side as a player character Saika uses in emergencies. Which doesn't make sense as presented, for if she had a PC of her own capable of going to these periods, she wouldn't have needed Tokyo in the first place and stalked him for god knows how long. As Sign's events conclude and the Chrono Core is recovered from Tsukasa, you face the first of Shixel's goon squad, and these boss battles are tedious like everything else. But this time, because you've trained yourself to do the exact same damn thing on every level, the dynamic shift necessitated by the boss battles completely throws you for a loop in how to defeat them. Trommel, the first of them, is in turn rendered comatose by Geist, Shiksol's eighth member, that was assigned as the Hackers Group's overseer by CZ Corp's president and franchise big bad, Genius. Yes, that is seriously his name. Incidentally, this is the person Reiko Saeki was supposed to be talking to at the end of Trilogy, who was informing her about the dangers these hackers posed. And he is the one that hired them. Are the inmates running the asylum? The core games play out with their divergences, Kite less of a competent hero throughout due to Tokyo's actions, but Shiksel isn't seen again until Kubia's defeat, when Posaune, the second of them, shoots him with the same paralyzing gun Kite was shot with in the present. And if you guys can show up in these time periods, you can't do this to all of the Twilight Knights to get them out of your way? I don't know, I have a long dissertation that can show he has a few competitors for that. From this, Tokyo misses the point entirely of the climax of Kite's journey and the entire game has to deuce ex machina the core into their possession via past aura extracting it and giving it to them, having remembered him from the sign alterations. And she couldn't do that before, since she knew of Tokyo under these rules, and was there when Tsukasa's was extracted and given to him? Hell, her being present when Tsukasa gave hers to Tokyo is the only reason, story-wise, that she would even know about the Chronicors being in Kite in the first place. Because this is the past version of Aura that doesn't know of what's going on in the proper timeline. Granted, Tokyo doesn't care. He wants to rescue Kite over moving on to the next moment in the timeline, essentially abandoning the mission entrusted to him for something he has no way of changing. It only came about due to his own actions. Though I'm torn on whether that's a good thing or not. Even by this point in the story, I had already figured out these two were facilitating the machinations of the antagonists. But Tokyo's abandonment of his duties also shows him as a massive hypocrite towards his ideals as a hero. As he wants to be focused on helping this one person, he can do nothing more, instead of moving on and seeing if he can't do something later on. Though his interpretation of heroism, the idiotic kind that shows no understanding of what makes a hero, continues to bite him, as he's forced to let Shido fall comatose in the Roots timeline to correct its events. And instead of being sorry that he couldn't do anything, as said before, he sends Haseo off to self-destruction, and is rewarded for it in a way. Instead of inspiring him to harden his resolve and do what is necessary to save everyone from his perspective, Aika comes to him and leads him to a field born of the timeline alterations to make him stronger. Except strength is not the problem, it's idealism. He has no idea what the fuck he's doing beyond thinking he's doing the right thing and helping. And even when he comes to question that specific thing right when he needs to, Aika tells him to think of who he's helped to regain his resolve and what he's doing. Tsukasa Kadoya is, in every respect, a better protagonist for this situation, as he fucking learned something from all of the heroes he encountered to earn their respect. Well, here, it is entirely the other way around. Tokyo being the source of what they came to realize on their own. What is Saika doing 
during all of this, you might ask? Taking a bath. Yeah. Psych is said to be 14 in this game, so this is fan service of an underaged girl, which is a recurring thing whenever we cut away to her in real life. Her repeatedly showing up in her holographic form, projected while wearing nothing but a towel, which serves to be sheerly superfluous, and wastes much of what could have been used to inform her character away from the bitch she's shown to be most of the game up to this point. But yes, thanks to Aika, Tokyo finally changes out of his school clothes and gains a battle form. His own X form. Now like many which I say worked, his looks terrible. So terrible, Tokyo initially comments on that, only for his opinion to change when he sees what his critiques are doing to her. And I should finally address Aika at this point, as this is finally when the game decides to do so itself. Aika is an AI, obviously. Her model was taken from a game Jotaro Amagi released in beta for three months called the Akashic Line, which was left on the internet after the beta closed. Said model is in turn based on Saika's mother, Ayaka, who died in 2012. And she is an Ida that evolved into true sentience in the course of a few months after Such encountered the game's files on the web. You know, it took years with a support system for Aura to reach that point. The reason Ida was so dangerous and destructive in the GU series was that it had no way of developing farther without the programs tied to the Cursed Wave, and thus had only found latching itself onto humans as a way to do that. Once all of it was freed from human contact, did it realize how caustic it was to them, and resolved to not do it again to seek its continued development. And that took place in late 2017. In 2018, it suddenly jumps into full sentient developed AI simply for merging with the programs from this game, before the World R2 shuts down. And it has to be before, as Saika tells us that she encountered Aika and took her in while playing the world in 2018. But as the World RX was only a recent release, that only leaves the short period R2 was active in 2018 for that contact window, after which Aika spends a fair chunk of time in Saika's head. And yes, that does fly in direct contradiction to my previous statement about Ida learning that such was an exceedingly bad thing to do. Then again, we could discount Returner from continuity as well, and just leave this as benign item that left the R2 system before Ovon's rebirth. But all Ida turned malicious when even some of them were infecting humans because of a shared network consciousness, and the rebirth just served to purge those connected people that were the root of everyone's suffering. Despite that, though, I could so totally see her taking the leap to full conscious AI by interacting with the world from the perceptions of Ika, and even explain why one is all soon and the other is all dare. But that's not the explanation given to us. I'll give her this, though. Ika's actually the only character introduced in Link I actually like. Probably because she gets more non-caustic in hindsight development than Tokyo or Saika and it occurs in the GU sect of the timeline. While Tokyo takes Hasei's place in his story, the missions are bookended by their interactions, eventually leading her to question why she even came into being, and long lamenting the tragedies the item before her wrought on so many innocent people. <laughs> You are made of stupid. Where would you even find food in an online game like that? This really should be more interesting than it is, but due to how fucking late in the game it is, it hits far past the point I gave a damn. I could have deserved a better game than this, honestly. With a sane backstory as she's not a bad character, especially concerning how things end for her. And especially detached from the Akashic Line nonsense. See, that game was made by Jotaro Amagi in 2014 as a testbed for the real digitization technology. Yes, he intentionally put tech that screws with someone's body to turn it into data into a video game he released to the public. 
while they repeatedly try to make Amagi seem sympathetic through this game, it actually does the opposite and turn Jotaro Amagi into a monster. Well, okay, it wasn't open to the public, but to an open beta, which has very little difference when you get right down to it. He used the beta to find a doubleware, a person his conversion would actually work on, so as to prove it was possible. And Tokyo is that player. Thus why I've yet to say Tokyo was selected at random. However, Saika used the Akashic Line data to track Tokyo down, simply so she could do this to him now. Also influenced from the fact that Aika's model was an fed PC that Tokyo was the only one to encounter within the game, which then influenced Aika's obsession with her post-Ida evolution. And you think this explains things, but it really makes you ask more questions. Chiefly... How all of this is even possible? Where did Amagi get the funding to make that game for his research if he wasn't hired by CC Corp until the following year? How did he develop that technology? In his teens of all things? And that's before even getting to his previous showcased idiocy concerning the Revive Aura plan, which gets more stupid when you learn why he was developing it in the first place, and who did fund his research. Because beginning with this game, there's now retcon to be an organization in the .hack universe that wants to forcibly digitize the entire planet's human population because in the 80s, a crackpot ecologist calculated that humanity would entirely wreck its only available habitats beyond repair in a thousand years. A thousand years. You know, if we are not capable of interstellar or intergalactic travel by the 2980s, we'll probably have other problems. And, you know, that kind of ecological research? That's been debunked for decades. Emma Wyland, the author of the original Epitaph of Twilight, and the founders of The Ultimate Company and CC Corp, it turns out, were all members of this ecologist's inner circle, and 100% were in agreement with her beliefs that the only way to stop this was to remove humanity from the equation. Meaning, the world's name is meant to be a bit more literal, as it was constructed to eventually replace Earth as humanity's habitat, completely ignoring the fact that, well, the servers that would contain the entire human population would require external maintenance, or everyone would die. In fact, that kind of does build a new context to why CC Corp wanted the Revive Aura plant completed, and as not just to run a game as was originally stated was the intent. For if they could control the digital god that ran their world... Well... No, the real world is being ruled by the online world! My rule will spread quickly across the real world! eventually allowing me to control people's very hearts. Yeah. The ultimate villains of the Dot .hack series, instead of being big business abusing advancements in technology to the point it escalates to threaten the planet, which actually is a bigger threat to progress and a positive well-being of the world, is now made by the third arc of the franchise, beginning with this game, to be ecological terrorists and their cult of supporters. <laughs> And I used to wonder why this franchise ended. This is all a fucking subplot that's barely given any attention to outside of an expositionary dump at the end of the game, by the way. It ends up more touched on in Quantum, Beyond the World, and a short expositionary OVA called the Thanos Report that was included on the Beyond the World Blu-ray. And I hate to sound like a broken record, but there's very little given throughout to really justify such extensive retroactive continuity, especially since this incident is otherwise ignored by the rest of the franchise. Yeah, this was more or less treated the same as Dot Hack Roots. Keep what you need, discard everything else. And the only thing that sticks is Jotaro Amagi goes from a reckless, egotistical narcissist overconfident in his ability to achieve his goals that he disregards safety into a megalomaniac. And mind you, this all occurs towards the guy while he is still catatonic and legally insane from the brain damage he received from his boss attempt to complete the RA plan. Maybe if the game was focused around this story, kind of like it is with Log Horizon or Sword Art Online, 
it could have worked, but not in the way it's presented here. Though at the very least, there is an explanation of why. Jotaro was significantly impacted by the death of Ayaka, Saika's mother, and saw real digitization as a way to render people immortal in code, preserved as such for as long as they wished. Once more, I need to watch Log Horizon, and potentially sort out online, if simply to weigh the merits of these three similar series and their developments. Anyways, at the conclusion of the GU storyline, the deceptions begin to unravel. Saika was sent the disc that put Tokyo in the game and information about Jotaro, told that he was locked at the top of the Akashic Records, but too little too late, as they are confronted at the top of the records by the remaining Shiksel members, who declare Saika and Tokyo the villains in this whole mess. Which, they kind of are. I mean, no one's actually a good guy in this situation, but at the very least, Shiksel were hired to do a job for the company that owns the game that what they were hired to do is completely morally bankrupt is besides the point, as it's subjugating a sentient entity to the whims of big business by torturing them. But Aura was in no danger after she sealed herself in the records, as Shixel would not have ever obtained the chronocores from the timelines the way they were going about things. However, throughout the game, Tokyo has been having surges of severe pain, which Flugel, Shixel's leader, informs is a side effect of real digitization. Shixel's player characters were constructed along the lines of a similar system, taking advantage of the world's ability to transfer the consciousness of a person into a player character to do such at will in order to gain advanced capabilities in their missions. I'm just rolling with things at this point. And they explain that this process eventually proves to destroy the human that is real digitized by their mental and physical patterns becoming unstable when stored in this form. For some reason. Error in the coding, I don't know. But it degrades until they become a lifeless shell as their ego boundaries degrade. However, they are in turn betrayed by Geist and the member called Metronome. The latter because Flugel seemed to disregard the junior members' concerns about Tokyo's doubleware status, wanting to extensively analyze Tokyo's player character for data on it, which eventually put him off the deep end. And Geist is an AI Jotaro made after he went insane. Either that or it was before that when he was still working on the Raw Vibe or plan, but neither works for me as he really was not inferred to understand what he was doing enough to have created artificial life, even if Geist says he himself is a Flash clone of Jotaro's brain shoved into a player character. And with the state of the world at the period of time Jotaro would have had access to it in order to incubate Geist's creation, yeah, he should not have been able to do that. Brain Flash cloning for AI creation a la the Halo series is also something never previously introduced into the Dot .hack lore and is once more a hand-waved element that needs explaining to possibly work. And no, he wasn't created from a fusion of the dummy Eptap, and that part of himself Jotaro lost when he tried the RA plan, well, one Eptap short. As that would have actually worked with canon, but was not what they say happens here. They are betrayed, simply so Tokyo could get to the end of the Akashic Record, and to Aura, where the trap springs. See, Geist was the one that sent the real digitization disk and all the related info to Saika, and it included a virus that would activate when in Aura's presence, which would infect and subjugate her, turning her into a rampant AI. Now, I've been inferring this for some time, but I honestly took the interpretation from the greater game that the Akashic Record was a manifestation of Aura's memory. Her memories of the heroes of the world, and Sakaki, emerging to defend her when she was captured by Shixel, and making it so no one would be able to get in to see her. But instead, Tokyo and the like opened the door for her memory to be corrupted and to influence her processes away from stability. These realms essentially being her version of Morgana Mode Gone's eight epitaphs, fracturing herself to keep her stable and their destruction or revision destabilizing her enough that this virus could even affect her. And I take that position because a virus doing in the ultimate AI that should be able to ward off this kind of attack 
It seems amazingly contrived, when my explanation more plays off of the expected life cycle of an AI, and a more symbolic representation of life that Aura has thus far been following. Aura was born in Sign, and again in the core games. She grew through adolescence and became a mother on her own, before leaving her children to carve their own path in life, and thus grew old, senile, and thus, this would symbolically be her death throes before beginning her life again. Because this entire event comes to be known as Twilight Dusk, the death of the ultimate AI. The Akashic Record was actually built as a control system for both the Greater Network, CC Corp trying to rule the world and all that, and also Aura, which when they captured her, she turned against them. Which is not that far from my statements, as the Twilight Knights are made up of her memories. So there's not that much which needed to be changed to sync up in that manner. Anyways, bugs begin to propagate and attack the world's players, while everyone endeavors to stop Metronome and Geist, for no one wanted what would result from Aura's total corruption. So, they follow Geist, and find him standing next to Jotaro, who is also catatonic. And I seriously believe this Jotaro to be the piece of him that was ripped out of his head at the end of the Revive Aura plan, but Link has another explanation for this. And this is the point in the game where Link plays Total Revisionist History with Project GU and the Revive Aura plan. That it was actually about achieving Jotaro's vision of the Immortal Dusk, and to begin real digitization of the planet's populace, which Junbat Soya was actually responsible for destroying with the fire at CC Corp, and wanted to use the RA plan to construct its control system he himself would manage. All of which flies in face of the terminal disk. Or, Geist is insane himself and has been doing all this on his own from fragmented memories of Jotaro's, so we can't actually trust that information at all, either. Probably help that he expects Jotaro to recover when reunited with his body. However, repeated statements in this section give the implication he's suffering from the final stages of the psychological and physiological breakdown of being real digitized for far too long, instead of this being the section of his consciousness that got ripped out of him when the Revive Aura plant failed. Then again, like I said, they're retconning that entire thing. Quantum, incidentally, features a person whose consciousness has been stably stuck in the world for seven years without deterioration. I have problems with that little tidbit, but if it's just Jotaro's consciousness that's stuck here, he should be stable. And what makes a digital realm a too harsh environment for a digitized human to survive in anyways? Once something is turned to data, it's stored in a stable medium that isn't easy to degrade. Or does it relate to the dynamic processes inherent to organic life that is too complex for a computer system to keep running in when more than just the optical system that is our consciousness is uploaded in that form? I have so many questions about this that are never answered. Nor is why the terminal stage of this devolution of a psyche, the person devolving into some form of monster, which the party has to put down. It's after this that the corrupted aura, known as the Queen of Demise, manifests, in an odd amalgamated form exceedingly reminiscent of Kubia from GU, and begins the process of real digitizing the entirety of humanity, as was directed by the virus. It has driven her completely insane in every respect, which still fits my rapidity theory, believing this is the best way to express her love and devotion to the people of her world, by taking everything from them and into total safety, even as the monsters of the world and the data bugs her corruption spawns go around killing the populace. They get the idea that, says Tokyo carried the virus, he could then carry a vaccine to it. As in, they make a vaccine and insert it into him, instead of analyzing the virus that was in him to develop a vaccine. In other words, they do something that won't actually do what they need to stop Aura, simply to make Tokyo the hero of the game one last time. It doesn't work. At all. It in fact does less than nothing, as it prompts Aura to begin using attacks that erase PC data, meaning the Twilight Knights, all being AIs, are quickly wiped out. So, to stop Aura in her madness and correct the damage Tokyo, Saika, Shixel, CC Corp, and Geist have caused, Aika sacrifices herself and dies into the corrupted Aura, restoring her true memory, setting her free from the Akashic Record, 
and the two moving beyond the world once more, out of the influence of anyone trying to manipulate her, and thus defeating the Immortal Dusk. Yes, Tokyo and Saika were so worthless as characters, they inserted a new one mid-game to serve as the actual hero at its climax. Okay, not exactly mid-game, but that is where she even became fucking relevant. Aika does die from this, seeing it as the purpose she was created to complete. Past this point, Tokyo fusions out of the world and ends up hospitalized for the strain of being in the system for sanity knows how long, and CC Corp once more covers up any sign of their actions, almost ending the world. Speaking of which, GU ended with CC Corp going under heavy investigation by independent parties CC Corp could not bribe or influence. Whatever happened to that? And then, weeks later, after Tokyo confronts Saika about her mourning at the loss of Aika and the further catatonic state Jotaro has been forced into, they re-enter the world using real digitization to attend a party in Netslum during the events of Dathak Unison with all of the Twilight Knights that were AI expressions of Aura's memories, when Aura is now gone and should have put all of her memories back in her head. It's mainly so Kite and Flugel can meet to disband their respective groups, but once more it's treating the facsimile AIs as the real person they are based on. However, AI Helba shows that in this section of the Akasha record, they found a mended Shim doll, one that Tokyo had given Aika in the GU timeline that had been broken when Aika sacrificed herself to Aura, implying she may still exist somewhere out there, which of course is never shown. Link is the worst game in the Dot .hack franchise, and objectively, when I set aside my dislike of the Naruto games, likely to be CyberConnect's overall worst video game. The gameplay sucks, the main story is barely intelligible, and difficult to follow regardless of translation status. They screw up depictions of the entries they try to tribute along the course of it, and promote characters that are terrible and you are given little to nothing to connect to. The villains are atrocious and so spartanly seen you could have cut Shixel down to just Flugel and Geist and not lost anything critical. And the retcons necessary for this game's story to even come about, I feel work against the rest of .hack's lore. But despite all of that, it's probably only the third worst entry overall. It escapes being higher because the first and second slots, Roots of the Legend of the Twilight Bracelet anime respectively, harmed appreciation of parts of the series that were far better than those entries, and made people uninterested in experiencing them. At the very least, Link affects nothing as it is entirely standalone, versus being an atrocious adaptation of a much better and relevant to the greater story arc manga, and being a prequel series that fails in every possible way of being a prequel series, and showcasing events that are backstory to the next series while sabotaging effectively telling its own story. The only advantage they have over Link is they are far, far shorter. But Link made me appreciate a lot of the nuances of Sign, the core games, most of the novels, and especially GU, because of how easily wrong they could have gone. Though yes, the retcons do carry over to Quantum, but they are barely even mentioned as more than throwaway lines of exposition, so it comes off as one person's opinion on a person and the machinations they intentionally caused, versus all of their nonsense being intentional. You could literally skip from GU to Quantum and miss nothing of critical importance to the franchise's greater story arc. Hell, you could skip from GU to Beyond the World and say the same. But, to the greater series, this new context to why Aura has stayed gone can be considered important, but not a critical detail, as it ends with her being gone in the same way she was throughout GU. It's just getting to it is exceedingly tiresome in excess of every other entry in the franchise. I'd like to say the cross-series character interaction could be a draw, and it might be once they're translated, but if I were to actually play the damn game again once such was completed, it'd take over 60 hours of tedium and revision I didn't like to get to it. On top of a main story I found stupid both in isolation and with respect to the greater franchise. So yeah, while I'd have preferred to not be ignorant to the story, I'm siding with Band of America on its decision to skip it. Yeah, I know, hell's frozen over. 
As a dot .hack fan, I can't stress enough how you should avoid this piece of crap. Get the summarized version that's out there if need be. It skips past most of the stupid. But do not play Link. It is not worth it. Fuck, I really did not mean to go this long.